Let's begin. Uh, we're looking at... Uh, hello. I'd like to remind everyone that uh, we don't have electronic devices on the class as well. Uh, I've noticed a little bit of a regression on the cell phone front and so forth, which I find distracting and uh, so do other people in the class. It, there's a sort of a general, I don't even think you're aware of it when you use stuff like that, that it actually has a environmental impact. Um, so let's look at uh, quite an extraordinary figure. Uh, so it's, I think it will be well worth your attention this morning. Uh, we moved on and we moved on by centuries. We are now, uh, we moved from the classical era, so we looked at Ovid last time, and his Metamorphoses, an epic poem, although we only looked at the intro just to uh, show in many ways what the, uh, some of the seminal differences that will arise uh, between what will constitute a Christian understanding of, of God and human nature and nature of the underworld, uh, the nature of heaven, the nature of goodness, whether there is such a thing as good and evil, all of those things were implicated in uh, Ovid's view of, uh, of the origin of all things. And so I presented it there uh, without being able to really tease out the implications of that um, because it's just an introductory lecture in first year. Uh, so I can't possibly do that, but I thought it was necessary to at least point out some of the basic differences that will then get teased out and some of them we're going to see here in this poet whose name is Dante Alighieri, uh, a, an Italian Renaissance poet writing uh, around 1300, born in 1265 actually. And he's writing so basically almost 1300 years after Ovid is writing his Metamorphoses and, and Virgil for that matter is writing his uh, Aeneid. And uh, I've got up on the screen behind me a, uh, a fresco which is inside this building here in Italy and in Florence. It's called Il Duomo. It's the cathedral in the center of the city. Let me show you a picture of that. Well, I probably shouldn't have do done that, but I'll do it anyway. Florence Il Duomo. Let's see if we can get the famous picture of this. There you go. That's a pretty good, or even better from a distance. How to get most out of your visit. There you go. This famous cathedral in the cent of center of Florence, Italy, if you watch any of the docu-historical dramas these days, um, the De Medici or so. Anybody watch any of those? No. Okay. Um, portraying a, a famous Florentine banking family, but the Florence itself is a work of art. And in the city of Florence, there are countless art galleries which are um, containing treasures really that are without peer in the world. So F Florence is a city state within uh, Italy and it is precisely that it is a city-state and that's going to be part of something that I, I will talk about today because it's the context for Dante's uh, great work uh, is the historical political context that will have to be a part of our discussion here but it's during the time of the so-called Renaissance and uh, you've heard all heard of the Renaissance before but you don't necessarily uh, make strong associations with what that, what constitutes the Renaissance, what exactly is that. Let's see if I can blow that up again. Oh, that would help. Uh, the Renaissance is the French word, uh, which is used in English as well, for the rebirth. And what is it a, a rebirth of? It's a rebirth of classical learning. So in the middle of the 13th century, probably a century before that as well, there is a, 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 a rebirth of classical learning in the middle of what is now a Christian world. And the Christian world has a pope uh, located right where he is now in the Vatican, uh, right 
in the, basically in the confines of the city of Rome. But it also has a Holy Roman Emperor. And the Emperor presides over uh, the Christendom, the whole of Christendom, which will include many of the countries that we know now uh, call European nations. And there is a conflict between the uh, Pope and the Emperor over supremacy to some degree. That's also in the backdrop of this uh, work. And uh, when Dante writes about this, that, that those political conflicts work they, their way into his, his own uh, poetic work. And I'll have to come to explain that uh, because it's, there's a lot of names that are going to be unfamiliar to us and to some degree are irrelevant for the purposes of your uh, appreciation of the work here. But they are actually there. And uh, so I'll, I'll come to that. But this is being written, or rather this fresco is on the wall inside this place, Il Duomo, which is itself a product of the uh, architect's name is Brunelleschi, who creates this terrific dome, the largest dome in the world at the time. An architectural marvel exists to this day. And this is painted on the inside of it. Now this man, is the most famous of all Florentines. You've heard of Leonardo. You've heard of Michelangelo. These are Florentine art authors or uh, artists. Um, Raphael, their paintings are in the galleries there. Their statues are in the galleries. But he's the most famous of all the Florentines. And he's depicted here gesturing downwards. He has a book here in his hand. And if you, we could talk about what he's pointing to, that, but this would be an art class if I was talking about the painting more than anything. I, d I don't want to get too distracted by that. But he is pointing downwards here to various things that are described in his uh, work, which is called the Divine Com Comedy in English. It's just commedia in uh, Italian, the comedy. Now, if you come to read the comedy, by the way, and we're only going to look at the Inferno for the purposes of this class. I don't have time to go through the whole of uh, Dante's work. It would take the whole semester, I think, uh, at least. But it, he is gesturing to three things. One down here, and you can't really see it very well because of the light, but this is the Inferno. This is hell. And what he's pointing to here is a part in scripture which is leading him down to hell and his readers, which is lust. He's pointing to hell. Then behind him, there is a mountain going upwards. This is purgatory. And then over here, and this is interesting, he has the Il Duomo, but actually this is paradise. These are the three books that constitute the divine comedy. And he's gesturing to one and the, the danger of, of hell and the torments of hell to his audience and his audience inside is inside the cathedral of course a christian place of worship and uh, dante is depicted there now so let me with all of that in mind i just want to get give you a sense of a visual image and how important this man dante was writing by the way not in latin anymore although he would have known latin but rather writing in italian the a vernacular language which is itself an interesting thing and i will also say just because I suspect people don't know this, uh, the nation of Italy, as we now know it, does not yet exist in Dante's day. There are a variety of city-states, of which Florence is one, and Rome is another, and Venice is another, and Milan is another, and Bologna is another, and Padua another, and so forth. They're, they're, all of these are little um, dukedoms, principalities, and all of them have their own culture, and it's a Christian culture. It's also a familiar culture, as in families are really important. So one of the things about Florence is that its original families, those that founded the city, have vast influence in politics within the city. And they tend to uh, divide along family lines. So there's a lot of factionalism that arises. In fact, if you look at the, the history of the uh, Renaissance, it's a very bloody history. 
extraordinarily bloody, terrible deeds are done during the Renaissance. On the other hand, there's a great deal of civic pride. To be a Florentine is not to be an Italian. As I say, Italy doesn't exist. You are a Florentine, and he is the Florentine of all the Florentines. Now, what's interesting about this is come the 19th century, when uh, nation states are uh, constituting themselves. Now, we take them for granted, but the nation state is a sort of a 19th century invention. Germany does not exist in the 19th century, at the beginning of the 19th century. There are little, all hundreds of little duchies and, and dukedoms and so forth and principalities and little princes all over the place, aristocrats, and they rule over their little area of land, but there is no Germany. That's a late or mid 19th century invention. Likewise, Italy. So when Italy comes about in the mid 19th century, they are all speaking in different tongues. There's a Florentine dialect, there's a Roman dialect, there's a Milan uh, dialect, and, and they don't understand one another. There's a Neapolitan dialect, that of Naples. It's not that there's no commonality, but it's a very, very different language. You have trouble understanding people from another city. Same in Germ Germany, by the way. To this day, there are significant differences, and people uh, who grew up in Canada, they don't have an expectation that people in Toronto will not be able to understand the people in Hamilton. The people in Toronto might dislike the people in Hamilton, although not half as much as the reverse is the case. But they will understand they will speak the same common language, not so here. So what's interesting here, and the reason I'm going through this long-winded explanation, is that when they create this state, which they call Italy, they have to have a language that is going to be called Italian. And what is that language? It's the language of this man. It's the Florentine dialect. And that's because this work is considered to be such of such great significance uh, and of national pride in Italy that they adopt Dante's Florentine dialect as Italian. So this is standard Italian. When you read Dante's Florentine work, the Com Commedia, you're reading Florentine, which is now Italian. And so it would be taught in schools. If you grow up in Naples, you probably speak a local dialect, and, and you would be taught Italian in the classes. But you're, so you probably speak sort of two. It's not just slang. It's, a diff it's almost a different language. Same thing if you were in Germany. If you were in, in parts of Switzerland, they speak German. In the north of Germany, they have to have subtitles on the screens to understand what they're saying in Switzerland. And everyone learns German in school. It's called High German. Same thing in Italy. So this man, uh, Dante, creates a work of fiction which is so powerful that he, he is put inside the cathedral as the preeminent Florentine artist describing something of theological significance, because remember it's inside the cathedral, which is right in the center of the city. And the work that he writes is written in a, in a language that's so potent and important that it's adopted by the whole country. And the same thing will be true of Luther's German, by the way. So Martin Luther's German becomes standard German. It's really interesting. So there are certain figures who we know as historical figures, just by name, but their, their influence through their writing is so potent that you can't really think as a German without Luther's language influencing your thoughts. And same with Dante. So, and how does he begin? Nel mezzo del giorno, del, nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita, mi ritrovai per una selva oscura. In the middle of life's journey, I found, when I had journeyed half of our life's way, I found myself within a shadowed forest. But those first lines, nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita, are famous in Italian. Um, and I'm going to talk about the language a little bit here. Uh, this is, by the way, an epic. Yet another epic. It has features of it that are a little less epic than some of the others. There are certainly distinctions, but it is nonetheless an epic because it, it has an invocation of a muse, among other things. 
It will also have certain other features that we're going to note are similar with foregoing epics, and it explicitly invites comparison with foregoing epics by having a figure which we ought to recognize as the guide through the whole journey, at least the journey up to this point. And that man's name is Virgil. Virgil is the man who guides Dante down through the inferno and up Mount Purgatory up to a certain point and then he has to hand him over to a figure who can take him up to paradise because of course Virgil himself did not know God and so he could not take him any further. But let me backtrack a little bit and say a little bit about Dante. Um, as I say, born in 1265, he had a pretty tough uh, childhood. His mother died when he was five. And his father when he was 18. And he was, his marriage was arranged before his father died, probably when he was 14 or 15. And we don't know much about his relationship with his wife. Doesn't mention her much. Um, which is interesting because Certainly here in the Commedia, what we have here is Dante not just as the author of the poem, but as the hero of the poem. So it's sort of, it's quasi-biographical in a sense, in that autobiographical even, but his wife is not mentioned in this. But there is a woman who is mentioned in it. And her name is Beatrice in English. Beatrice. Now Dante, when he was nine years old, met this girl, Beatrice Portinari, who was eight. He saw her across the crowded room and fell in love with her. And he loved her his whole life. When I say he loved her his whole life, uh, I suspect it was a platonic attraction. She was his muse. She was the one he dedicated his, his poetry to. She was an idol of his, of sorts. And in doing that, he was fitting in with part of the context of the poetry of his day, which is love poetry. Now, I said to you last time, Ovid was writing these love poems called the Ars Amore, the, the Way of Love, and these were intensely immoral poems. So much so that even uh, the Romans are scandalized by them. And, uh, and he is regarded as somebody that the Romans ought not to follow, even though he has some popularity. But Dante is also writing love poetry, and that's in accordance with the customs of his day, which are writing within the courtly love tradition. I need to say a little bit about the courtly love tradition. In the middle of the, around the 12th century, thereabouts, there are French troubadours writing songs about love, about romantic love, as we would call it, about the love between a man and a woman, but these love relationships are often illicit. It's usually an uh, inferior, from a social rank perspective, an inferior man for a, an aristocratic woman, his social superior. Uh, it's, it's all shot through the story of King Arthur and, the, and uh, his court. So think about Lancelot and Guinevere, Guinevere the queen. It's King Arthur's wife. Who's Lancelot? He's his first knight. He falls for the queen. He not only falls for the queen, they have an affair. It breaks apart the kingdom. Th that idea of a love relationship which is, which, which is immoral and breaks social hierarchy is very common subject matter of poetry in this period. It's, this is in the middle of the Christian era, right? So this is in the middle of a period which we would regard as Christian. But the love poetry which is written and with these sorts of subject matters in mind is 
what we call the courtly love tradition, and it's in a form of literature that does not exist in the ancient world, which you will probably know, or have heard of at any rate, the sonnet. Invented by an Italian poet by the name of Petrarch, Francesco Petrarch. Dante was much influenced by Petrarch and very much influenced by the idea of love. In fact, so much so that he writes poetry on that very thing. And there's an association in these poets uh, of of love with this sort of romantic attraction. Now, what, what are the features of this poem, of these types of poems? In general, the man uh, pr pronounces himself a worshiper of the lady. The lady is, project is presented as being divine in being, like an angel, like a goddess. Her hair is compared to whatever. Her, her lips are like rubies. Her eyes are like stars. Her breasts are like whatever. But there are certain stock conventions in courtly love poetry, and in general the man is, is, professes that he is captivated and is incapable of doing anything other than worshipping the woman. These ideas which we associate with romantic love, C.S. Lewis suggests, originate in this period. But they're so influential that they, they exist to this day. So on Valentine's Day when people exchange love, uh, and there's these we would probably say overstated professions of undying love, those are courtly love conventions. I will never love anyone else. You have caught, ca captured my heart and there can never be anyone else for me. I would rather die than break my vow. And the vow is towards somebody who is forbidden. Those are features of the love poetry of the period. Now Dante was very much uh, influenced by this, in, sa in fact so much so that he himself was writing these sorts of poems. Now, I need to say that to you because it, it will explain something that we're going to see in uh, one of the cantos in the Inferno, which is Dante himself falling as if dead. But let me backtrack with this. But, he fall but Dante falls in love with Beatrice, he loves her his whole life, but he loves her more, it may have at first been, when he's a nine-year-old, it's, it's, it's probably relatively innocent at, at that stage. And he is, she is more of an ideal for him. She is idealized, in fact. She's presented as a woman who is uh, possessing of all virtues, all beauty, all goodness, this is very easy to do if you never actually have to live with somebody and you just love them from afar. You can make them into an, uh, an ideal out of them, right? And sh so she functioned that way and she functioned that way in the poem as well. And we'll, we'll see that. But it also allows him to project her as this, um, make a connection between the loves that he bears for a woman with the love that he has with God. It's idealized. And there's a, a sense of what, when C.S. Lewis writes another work called The Four Loves, he makes an analogy between our, our human loves and the love of God. And it's largely rooted in this sort of uh, observation that Dante makes a great deal on this. So he's building on the courtly love tradition. And love is the sign of a noble nature at that point, a good nature. So those who are truly good will love deeply. And in fact, the whole of the Commedia, which we are only going to read the Inferno of, is based around love. The whole of the poem is organized by the conceptualization of love. Love is the thing that organizes the whole poem. Now, this already distinguishes this poem from uh, Ovid's poem, and certainly Virgil's, and certainly Homer's. Love is not the motivating factor in those poems, but it is here. And when he does that, Dante is, of course, responding to the courtly love tradition, but he's also responding to, I would say, St. Augustine. Writing in the fifth century, and Augustine portrays um, 
even when he comes to uh, his uh, De Doctrina Christiana on Christian teaching, he talks about the importance of love in understanding things properly. And he describes all of our, not just of our desires, but even our ways of understanding things as forms of love. And there's a right object for our love and there's a wrong object for our love. The right object for our love is God. What's the greatest commandment, Jesus was asked. His answer is to love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the greatest commandment. Now, Augustine organizes his thought on that basic idea that love is the crucial factor in all of life and we are to love God above all things in fact nothing can replace that and in fact that's the definition of sin for Augustine the definition of sin is loving something other than God as God and that can be a woman as well so if you love even if you love even your wife more than God that's a form of idolatry and it will lead you here. And we will see when we come to the inferno, we're going to come to this but before the end of the class, that the inferno is organized according to misapplied loves. And they're categorized. And there are, there are sort of circles of hell according to the, this categorization. But love is what motivates all of these, uh, the, the entire poem. By the way, Dante gets married. He's a Renaissance man. This is the Renaissance with the Renaissance man. A Renaissance man is an all-rounder. He does everything well. He busies himself in all things. Uh, Dante not only wrote poetry, he served as a soldier. He was involved in politics. He was a, uh, involved in all sorts of things, just like everybody in, in his day. And he was, and, and, uh, and he got married, furthermore, and had children. They're not the subject of the poem. It's not because they're not important to him. It's because they're not important for the purposes of what he uh, is presenting in this poem. And the thing he's presenting in the poem is, is, of course, Dante the man. But the Dante the man is really a character in the poem. And what the character Dante represents is everyone. So his journey, he says, no, I said, nel mezzo del camin di nostra vita, in the middle of the journey of our life's way. So it's not, the hero now is not some other figure. It's not Aeneas. It's not Odysseus. It's him, but he is representative of each one of us. So everyone here is represented by Dante. It applies to everyone. It's he, it's he that is undergoing the journey, and yet we are all, it's our journey that he undergoes. It, we all have the same sort of journey. And when he goes down and he's going to go on this journey, and it's a three days journey, he is describing something that will be true of every person. It's a theological epic. It applies to people in the past and the present and the future. Now, in that sense, it is superior to Virgil's epic, which was a Roman epic for sure, but it was also a pagan epic. It, he did not know anything about the nature of God. We'll, we'll come to see that in, in the poem. Dante himself will describe that very thing. And yet he's influential. He, he's a, a, a guide for Dante because he's an epic poet and because he's, such a, uh, he's renowned as such a brilliant uh, writer. And Dante sees him as a role model in that sense. Now, I, I, I could talk about the, and I'm, I think I'm going to skip it just for the sake of brevity. In, in Dante's day, there are two factions within the city that are fighting it out. And the city really is almost like a, a war zone. But it takes place not only within the city, it also takes place uh, throughout the entire country of Italy, which doesn't exist as Italy, but all of the city-states uh, in Italy, and it also takes place throughout the entire Roman Empire, by which, by which point it's now the Holy Roman Empire, and there's a Holy Roman Emperor. And these factions within it are called the Blacks and the Whites, the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. 
the Guelphs are the papal party. The Ghibellines are the party of the Holy Roman Emperor. So even within the city, the, the, the familial factionalism is marked uh, by the same factionalism that goes all the way up to the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor. So there are two forces at work here. And so when Dante throws people into his underworld, his inferno, uh, and mentions them by name, he's, he's making political commentary as well. Um, but I'll, I'll skip over that simply for the sake of, uh, for sake of time. Um, because really I've got way too much on my plate to go th through all that. But he, what, he began as a papal supporter and flipped over to be a supporter of the Holy Roman Emperor. And in fact, he sticks one of the, 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 his, the contemporary Pope who's alive while he's writing it in hell. Which is, you know, don't mess around with a poet. Going to throw you in hell and everyone will be reading about it forever. This guy, this Pope is in hell. He meets him down there. He's still alive. Anyway, that's one way of damning your enemies. Uh, but he's seeing that he's seeing this as a reflection of, of how politics ought to be. He sees, he sees the Pope as a form uh, not of the Antichrist, but not far off it. He's on the wrong side of history, if you will. Um, in the Divine Comedy, let me say this as well. He, so he is commenting on politics, but he's also making commentary on uh, science and philosophy and theology. And so Dante's Commedia is just like the ancient Greek epic. It is an encyclopedic work. And, and Dante is vastly learned. So that's part of the challenge for us as readers. We're not going to pick up all of the references here. We would find that an impossibility, really. But it's, 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 and he means it to be a poetic equivalent of another figure you might have heard of at this point. His name is Thomas Aquinas, who writes a work called the Summa Theologica. He's already written it. It's a, theo it's a work of systematic theology. Dante's uh, Commedia is meant to be the poetic counterpart to Aquinas's great work. That's how he sees it. So he's writing at the height of medieval scholastic thought. The scholastic thought is a reference to Aquinas. And he's trying to combine all branches of knowledge on the absolute principle of God. God who in his nature is love. And so the Commedia is, as I say, a poetic attempt at this, this all-inclusive form of uh, presentation that Aquinas presents. Now, it also uses the principle of allegory. And I, I'm not going to go into this too greatly, but in, in this period, even when scripture is read, but all, when all of life is read and understood, they understand it in terms of fourfold allegory. And I'll, I will do this. And in fact, in a, I, I put this in the, I think I put this in the, on the course syllabus. Two seconds here. In a letter to his patron, Can Grande. Have I got it there? No, I don't. Okay, so I didn't put it in there, but I do want to put this on, so I'll leave that for a second. Just leave that in the background for now. Uh, in a, a, a letter to his patron, he talks about how his comedy is to be understood on four levels, not just one. It needs to be understood literally. This happened. Right? That's, uh, that's a basic understanding. It happens on, you can read it on a literal, so you have to, not only do you have to read it and understand the characters and events happening there, you have to understand them on different levels. One is you understand it simply literally. A second is uh, allegorically. A 
third is moral, and the fourth is anagogical. So we can use this uh, in reference to the Exodus event. The Egyptian, the people of Israel are brought out of the land of Egypt and in, into the promised land, the Exodus event. That can be understood literally. But it's also an allegorical thing. It refers to the life of Christ, the Logos, the Word of God. He, he leads his people out of the land of Egypt into the promised land. So it's not just a reference to the Egyptians and the Israelites leaving. It's a reference to what Christ did. It also applies morally, it applies to the individual. It's about the soul's pilgrimage out of slavery, uh, the slavery of sin, to a state of enjoying God and being blessed by him, which ultimately will have an anagogical equivalent, which is your ultimate destiny in the new heaven and the new earth. It needs to be read on those four levels. That's his suggestion for us. This is an intensely complicated way of looking at things. Question. What does the fourth one mean? Anagogical. It drives you that way. Toward the goge here is to be a goge is to be driven up to, to be driven up. You're being compelled in a certain direction. That it. Think of it eschatologically. So on the one hand, it's literally about a, a journey from into the underworld, and it ends up in paradise where he's reborn. So that's the literal sense. The uh, allegorical sense, it's about the journey of Christ down into preaching to those in the underworld and rising up. Morally, it's that Christ's actions in all of his ways can be also uh, followed by those who call themselves believers. So there's a moral example. Not the crucifixion, but his life. It's a, it's a model for us to follow. And then finally, um, it's the reference to the ultimate eschaton of all human life. We will see God face to face at final judgment. So those features are there. Let me talk also about the extraordinary language in which this is written. So first of all, it's the divine comedy, and it consists of three canticles. The Inferno, the Purgatorio, the Paradiso. <coughs> These three canticles consist of 3 times 33 cantos. And then there's one on top of it. It ends up being 100. There's an intro. That's what we're going to read it. So in the Inferno, there are 34. Well, one's just a prelude, a sort of introduction. But then each of them is marked by 33 <coughs> cantos. Within those 33 cantos, he writes in what he calls terza rima. Threefold rhyme. So how does that work? Well, translation is quite good here because it preserves that. The Mandelbaum translation, which I've suggested for you. When I had journeyed half of our life's way, I found myself within a shadowed forest, for I had lost the path that does not sway. Now, the uh, way and stray are A, and they're both A, right? But he can't capture what Dante does in Italian. I wonder if I can put Dante's Italian text up here to demonstrate, just so you can see it. I understand you can't read it. Dante. Uh, inferno Italian. Just give it to me. There it is. Whoa. Too much. There you go. So, 
Vita oscura smarita. Ta ra ta. A B A. The B, so A is the is the uh, thing that's repeated. So there's a repetition, A B A. The middle line then becomes the dominant line in the next. So it becomes ra becomes dura for te plura ra. So B C B. Te will then be the dominant in the next. So more te tro trovai scorte and so on. A B A B C B C D C D right and on and on. And it will go the it will maintain that through the entire poem. So that the artistry is extraordinary. The meter is constant, but so is the rhyme scheme, and it's called terza rima. So my point here is, is not to get caught up in that. It's the significance of the number three throughout the whole poem. And the three is a reflection of the Trinity, the nature of God, God who is in his nature love, and in fact the three relationship of the three persons of the Trinity is described as being loving, eternally loving. Before the creation of the world, it was loving, because God himself is love. He did not create out of a need for love in himself. He had love, but he created out of love. But not because he needed it, but just out of grace. That forms the context of the whole poem. And the whole poem goes that way, that threefold. And one final thing I'll say about a three, because it occurs to me, at the last word of each of the three canticles, so the last word in the inferno, the last word in Purgatorio and the last word in Paradiso is one word and it is stars. Which are often re represented in scripture as angels. So that, those three levels that I talked about. So let's talk about, I, uh, about this just for a second. The inferno yeah, uh, so I talked about that there's a journey and it's a three-day journey and Dante projects, presents the three-day journey taking place between Good Friday and Easter Sunday at what, at, in what year? 1300. Over the course of three days, Dante himself, the pilgrim, will be undergoing the journey that Christ himself undertook when he died, was buried, and then was raised. So on the first day, um, he is in the underworld. He is in hell, in the inferno. During that, he is awakening to the reality of his sin. So the, the, the inferno can be, in terms of his consciousness of who he is as a Christian, is that he's aware that he's a sinner. And he finds himself, in the beginning of the poem, ensnared in sin, in fact. He found himself in a dark forest, and he got lost there. He's in the middle of life's journey. How old is he? He's 35. Why is he 35? Because our years are three score and 10, it says in scripture. He's a 35 year old man and he's lost. How has he got lost? Because he's walked off the narrow path. He's been deluded by the snares of this life, chiefly by his love of courtly love poetry. And he's not only been deluded, he's also deluded others because he's written the poetry. He's ensnared other people. We're going to find in the fifth canto when he describes two figures that they are reading a courtly love account and they fall in love because of this. It's a, it's a uh, wife for a brother-in-law and they consummate their love and they're in hell for it. And he wrote poems like this which led people astray. At the end of the canto, he falls down as if dead because he recognizes not only that he himself was tempted by this sin, but also he led others to it. So he falls as if dead. And so the, but the whole of the inferno is marked by a growing awareness of the sinfulness of sin. This, the purgatorio is, marks the purification of sin. Where is this? There. And it's, you, it's a progressive purification. When Dante, uh, we're not going to get to this, so I'm just going to say it now for the sake of your awareness. When Dante 
goes up the Mount Purgatory, he's going to be purged, purified of his sin. The angel at the outset on his forehead take, with, the, with the sword inscribes P times seven on his forehead. P for pecado, sin. The P's disappear as he ascends Mount Purgatory, as he's purged from those sins, as he goes up and up and up towards the earthly paradise at the top. He's purified from those things. Finally, so the, this is the purification, the atonement for sin. Now, this is not a Protestant view of salvation, needless to say. There's no purgatory in uh, Protestant theology. It's one of the things against which Luther protested. There is no such thing in scripture. And the church is asking for people to pay indulgences to keep their loved ones who are in purgatory. Now, these are Christians, it's the, but it's a painful, long period. To get them out of jail, of purgatory, for a long time, you can give uh, money to the church in terms of indulgences, and it will reduce their time there. Luther says this is an outrageous offense, but Dante doesn't see it that way. Yes? Where was it that they came up with this idea? Was it Dante in this book? That purgatory? Yeah. No, no, it already exists. It's, it's oh. part of Catholic theology. Um, there are texts in scripture um, that will suggest um, it, but I think it's pretty tendentious myself. But the doctrine of indulgences is held by the Catholic Church to this day. It's just not much pu publicized. But the money was used uh, for the selling of these indulgences to, to build great things and to, among other things, the Vatican. Vatican City was built through indulgences, St. Peter's. Uh, the sale of indulgences. At any rate, I, I'll get off track with that. This, uh, the purgatorio marks the purification of sin. The paradiso is the ascension uh, and to the contemplation of God. That's how the paradiso will end. Dante will look upon God as much as he possibly can. When he looks at God, he sees a very confused image of three figures revolving around one another and everything going around that. I'll come to that when we come to the last uh, class on this. But it's anticipating the process of salvation. Now remember, he, he's describing a vision. He's not saying he's actually in paradise. Because he, he comes back and tells the story. He didn't go up to heaven. If he ever went down, up to heaven, he would never come back down. He's not going to want to. He's describing something about what theology teaches and which he sees in this vision. Now, he's guided along the way. At first, he's guided, as I say, by Virgil, the epic poet, who leads him down through hell, which he knows all about, because he himself resides there, although at the top of it, in a place called Limbo, uh, along with the other epic poets. I'll come to that when we come to it. He goes down there, and then he leads them also up Mount Purgatory, but he can't go any further because he himself does not know the way to paradise. At that point, he gets passed over to the one who inspired his voyage to begin with, whose name is Beatrice. And Beatrice, along with two other ladies, has called for Dante. The others are the Blessed Virgin Mary and Saint Lucy, whose name is, represents light. Those three ladies call for Dante. Now, when they call for him, he's thinking of it theologically here. But again, note that it's connected to the Blessed Virgin Mary. It's not connected to Christ. But again, in Catholic theology, the Virgin Mary has a huge significance in a way she doesn't in Protestant theology. But it's connected here with the courtly love tradition, purified of its uh, carnal aspects. Comments or questions at this point? I mean, I've thrown a lot at you. I understand that, like a huge amount. It's just like pff, fire hose. Okay, so let me begin with the first canto. And the first canto, I'm sorry to say, is, the, is probably the hardest of the, whole, of the whole poem. It's more allegorical than the, the rest of the entire poem. So if you found it confusing and wanted to give up, don't give up. 
it, it, it is challenging and it's hard, it's hard to understand what's going on there. But the beginning itself is interesting. When I had journeyed half of our life's way, I found myself within a shadowed forest, for I had lost the path that does not stray. Ah, uh, it is hard to speak of what it was, that savage forest, dense and difficult, which even in recall renews my fear. So bitter, death is hardly more severe. So he's lost in a forest. Now these, that, even that description will, will echo through Western literature thereafter, being lost in a forest is a symbol of being, of going astray. You're, he's lost his way, he's lost his salvation. He's caught up in sin. And he can't get himself out furthermore. So he says, but to retell the good discovered there, what is the good? Well, we're gonna find, that's the whole purpose, by the way, of the comedia, the divine comedy, is not to tell about how bad his situation was, but to retell the good that he discovered in the middle of his lostness. What is the good? I'll tell the other things I saw. I cannot clearly say how I had entered the wood. I was so full of sleep, just at the point where I abandoned the true path. So he describes himself almost like sleepwalking. And again, he's using um, biblical language here. People are almost drowsy. Think of like the, uh, the apostles who Jesus tells uh, to stay awake and watch intently and they keep falling off asleep. He likewise is, is drowsy. He's losing his, uh, his desire for God, his watchfulness. But he said, but when I reached the bottom of a hill, it rose along the boundary of the valley that had harassed my heart with so much fear. I looked on high. He looked up the hill, and what does he see at the top of it? He sees a light. So he's down, in, down here in a valley, and he's looking up to Mount Purgatory, and he wants to get up there. He wants to climb to purge himself of sin through his own moral effort. That's what he wants to do. But he can't do it. He's going to be blocked, and he's going to be blocked by three beasts, but I'll come to that in a second. He says, I looked on high and saw its shoulders, the shoulders of the mountain, clothed already by the rays of that same planet which serves to lead men straight along all roads. So in other words, it's sunset, right? The light is going down. He's going to be in total dark very soon. The light's going down and all he can see is the light at the top of the mountain, but where he is, he's in darkness. He can't get his way up there. As at this, my fear was somewhat quieted. For through this night of sorrow I had spent, the lake within my heart felt terror present. And just as he who, with exhausted breath, by the way, this is an epic simile, he uses them repeatedly in the poem, just like we saw Virgil did and we saw Homer did, he uses epic similes over and again. And just as he who, with exhausted breath, having escaped from sea to shore, turns back to watch the dangerous waters he has quit, so did my spirit, still a fugitive, turn back to look intently at the past that never has let any man survive. Uh, the epic simile here in line 22 has important allusions. It has one of the illusion of a, a swimmer having escaped from the sea, like Aeneas, even like um, Odysseus. Uh, the second is the sea itself, the sea being perhaps like the Red Sea, which Moses parted to save his people. So a Christ figure, there are various allusions. By the way, this epic will be marked by both classical allusions and Christians throughout, and he mixes them all. Remember, this is the Renaissance. It's the revival of classical learning. He loves that, but he doesn't regard classical learning as superior to Christian learning. He regards it as needing to be baptized by Christian understanding. Yes? I suspect it's uh, Odysseus, I would have thought. But it, again, you're saying, well, where'd you get that from? I mean, come on, it's just a swimmer in the ocean. I'm not saying you're saying that, but, but I'm imagining a response, like, come on, it's a swimmer in the ocean. He's writing an epic. He has those sorts of uh, images in his mind. So he really strongly uh, has the epic um, works in, in the background of his mind. Probably Aeneas, though. He's escaped, and just as he's escaped uh, and is, is breathless, he starts trying to 
climb the hill. Now, this is the direct way to salvation. But he encounters three beasts. One's a leopard. One is a lion, and the third is a she-wolf, and they're blocking his path. Now, what these represent are unclear. Well, they're, in the literal sense, they are just those three things. Uh, depending on who you read on this, they, they will represent types of sin. In which case, uh, one suggestion is that the leopard represents fraud, deceit. The lion represents pride, and the she-wolf represents greed. The worst of them he met first, by the way. Fraud is the worst. We'll see that when we come to the inferno. The, the lowest parts of hell are those which are marked by deceit and treachery. And uh, whereas pride is marking the, the middle part of hell, where, and, and uh, greed, or the lust for things directly, is at the top part of hell. But I'll, I'll come to that in a second. But he, the, these, these things, these um, aspects of sin, keep Dante and hold him back from the direct path. Now, he's guilty of all three, by the way. So all three beasts are, are true of him, and he can't get by them. They're impediments to him. They're external, presented as external objects, but really they're features of his own psyche. And at that point, a figure intervenes. And who is he? Is a shade. Let me read line 61. So he faces the beast and he's terrified by it, and eventually he goes back down to the bottom of the valley where he was before. And he says, while I retreated down to lower ground before my eyes there, suddenly appeared one who seemed faint because of the long silence. The long silence between the time in which he first spoke. And so his image is not that visible because his voice, it's been a long time since it was heard, and yet he sees him. He says, when I saw him in that vast wilderness, have pity on me, were the words I cried. Whatever you may be, a shade, a man, remember it's dark. He answered me, not man. I once was man. Both of my parents came from Lombardy and both claimed Mantua as native city. And I was born, though late, sub Iulio, under the reign of Julius Caesar, sub Iulio, and lived in Rome under the good Augustus, the season of the false and lying gods. I was a poet and I sang the righteous son of Anchises, who had come from Troy when flames destroyed the pride of Ilium. So now we know who it is. It's Virgil. All of those th features mark him out. Where he was born, when he was born, what he wrote about, all of these things mark him out as Virgil, and that will become clear he's explicitly mentioned. But, but then he asks Dante, why do you not, why do you return to wretchedness? Why not climb up the mountain of delight, the origin and cause of every joy? Why not go up here? Now, Virgil says that it's the origin and cause of every joy, but that's because Virgil doesn't know what he's talking about. You have to understand, he's not a Christian. He thinks that to be the vir a virtuous man is the origin and cause of all joy. He doesn't realize that, in fact, um, the fall has happened and he has a fallen mind himself. He understands what virtue is. He understands what vice is, but he doesn't understand God's love. He doesn't understand those things. So he says, this place, the top of purgatory, is the origin and cause of all joy rather than God. So don't, he's not correct when he says that. He's a, he's a half-blind guide. He will lead him up there and he won't be able to go any further. But this is, this is Virgil's, uh, uh, sorry, Dante's response. And are you then that Virgil, you the fountain that freely pours so rich a stream of speech? I answered him with shame upon my brow. O oh, light and honor of all other poets, may my long study and the intense love that made me search your volume serve me now. You are my master and my author, you the only one from whom my writing drew the noble style for which I have been honored. Again, Dante is famous for his 
wonderful style of writing, and he drew his inspiration from Virgil himself. And you are the master. You're my master. I've learned from you. And then he explains about the beast that's in his way. Uh, and I will just skip over that because there's all sorts of stuff there, uh, for which I don't have time to go through there. But they are, they are uh, stopping him from going there. And Virgil replies, knowing more than Dante at this point, and, and explains that uh, there's another path, line 91, that you must take if you would leave this savage wilderness because he's going to hunt you down and you won't be able to get around him. And he says, you have to go down. Rather than going up, you've got to go down. Follow me down through the inferno. So you can't, you can't go up there directly. First, you're going to have to see, because clearly you can't see how wretched a creature you are. I didn't realize how pathetic you were, Dante. Really? You're that immoral a man? Well, then follow my lead here. Let me show you how wretched you are and steal you against the sins that tempt you. And then we'll go up. Yes? So did he say that in response to the statement, like, oh, you really love me? And like, <coughs> I guess <coughs> the idea that Dante idol uh, like idolizes no, it's, it's not the love of Virgil's writing. He admires Virgil. He doesn't love him in, the, in anything like uh, the sense other than he thinks that his writing is the great style, the grand style that he is famous for. So he loves him in that sense. And he regarded him as his role model. And in fact, he's even using him as his guide here. And, and also the imagery, and even he, he's literally going to be his guide, his mentor. Because when, when Dante said to Virgil, there are these three beasts and they're obstructing my way, Virgil says, really? Fraud and, and pride and greed are in your way? Okay, this is a problem. You have a moral problem. I can solve your moral problem. Let me show you the nature of where these things go. These things lead you. I will, okay, they're in your way. Let me show you why they should not be in your way. You, you have to realize how sinful sin is and let me show you how it's punished. And as he descends down the inferno then, he will see and no longer desire to be sinful. And then having gone through that, he, he will then rise up and he'll show him, here's how it is to be virtuous. And he'll say, and at the end of all that, I'll lead you to the promised land. Of course, then he disappears because he doesn't get it himself. But he does know, the un he does understand the nature of sin and the nature of virtue of a sort. Although we're going to see that Dante doesn't wholly agree with Virgil on the presentation of these things. But he's a guide of sorts. So that's why. Is that not? Okay. And he says, if you would descend, 121, if you would then ascend as high as these, where the blessed people are, a soul more worthy than I will guide you. So he's aware of this. He's not going to guide him up to heaven. A soul more worthy will guide you. I'll leave you in her care when I depart. It's not stated here, but that's Beatrice. That's the, she's gonna, he's going to pass over the baton to her at that point because she will go where he is. He can't go. Um, because that emperor who reigns above, since I have been rebellious to his law, will not allow me entry to his city. So heaven is presented as a city. Just like this is a city. So Florence is a representation of the eternal city, the eternal city, which is the city of God, which is the heavenly Jerusalem, which is how it's presented in the book of Revelation, right? The new heaven and the new earth is a bride beautifully dressed, comes down into the heavenly Jerusalem. The city of Florence is a representation of that. That's why Florence is depicted here. But it's, it's, an a so it's literally Florence. It's allegorically the heavenly Jerusalem. Okay? You have to understand that when you're looking at all these things. You have to understand on multiple levels. But he, he will then lead you there. And he says, he, that is God, governs everywhere but rules from there. There is his city, his high capital, and happy those he chooses to be there. 
And I, Dante, replied, O poet, by that God whom you would never come to know, I beg you that I may flee this evil and worse evils to lead me to the place of which you spoke, that I may see the gateway of St. Peter and those whom you describe as sorrowful. Then he set out and I moved on behind him. Okay, so now they, he leads them onwards. If you're interested, by the way, there are all sorts of depictions of Dante by um, famous artists. Uh, my version has some of those, Gustave Doré and so forth. I don't know if you've seen those. They're online, fabulous stuff. But he, uh, in the second canto, so the intro is uh, not part of the, Commedia proper, but the second count is, and at this point he then invokes the muses. So I'll just read a little bit of that and I'll, I'll try and make some progress here. The day was now departing, the dark air released the living beings of the earth from work and weariness, and I myself alone prepared to undergo the battle both of the journeying and of the pity, which memory, mistaking not, shall show. O oh, muses, O oh, high genius, help me now. A memory that set down what I saw. Here shall your excellence reveal itself. That's it. Yes. Who are these muses? Well, classically, there are nine, but it's unclear now. He refers to the muses almost in the same way as his memory. But his memory was marked by his vision. But where did the vision come from? Remember the vision, he, he didn't literally go on this journey. He describes it, but it's a poetic figure. It's not Dante actually went down to hell and came out. He imagined that he went down on this journey. And then he wants to remember, recall what that vision was. And it, he imagines that it took place between Good Friday and Easter Sunday in the year 1300. And so the muses of his memory of the vision which he, was, which he had of this journey which he didn't undertake, but he imagined he was undertaking, and etc. So it's complicated. Yes, but he, doesn't, but he doesn't really think that the muses are divine beings, the offspring of Zeus. But it's a power, uh, probably the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't say that there, but yes. Vain imagination. Well, that's, that's, I guess you don't like it much. But yes, it is, it's an imaginative work. But it's an imaginative work that's not, it's not fantasy per se. It's based on every bit of knowledge that a man of that period could possess. It is as knowledgeable as you would ever see. So what, like, can it be categorized? Because it's not a Greek, it's not, you said it's an epic. It is an epic. It, it, it casts itself as an epic. Is but now we're in the Christian era. So what does the what does Christianity say about the pagan epics? Well, it's a depict, depiction of gods that aren't gods. So this would be called like what would we? How do we view it now? Like it's an pagan, epic. Pagan epic? Is that no, it's a Christian epic. A Christian epic. Sure. Okay. He describes the one true God, who's the Trinity, who's inspired that. Leave your theological objections aside. Those, those are, you know, we, those can be discussed. Try and appreciate the work on its own terms. And you don't, I mean, like when we taught Homer, I don't expect people to believe that the gods are gods or anything other than that. But, but you have to try and get into the mindset of the author in order to get a sense of what is being said there. And then with that, you, you come away from it. Um, like when you think this is not true, it's not really a danger to you. But when he presents a thought that you never considered before, it, it actually, your mind expands and your, your, your vantage grows, the height from which you can look at things. It, it, because it's a different perspective. It's a, it's a totally different perspective. I can't imagine any of us would ever have a vision like this. It's not possible for somebody in our century to have such a vision. This is the product of his age in some ways. But I will also say Dante is influential on everyone who writes after him. Everyone who writes who reads. And everyone who writes while does read. 
It's not just self-expression. He's, he's, he's genuinely trying to present theology as he understands it. I'll, I'll come to that in a sec, but that's, that's how he presents it. So he, um, Canto 2. So there's a shift in perspective and content here. Um, it is effectively, Canto 2 is effectively as allegorical as the first canto. The sun is setting. Dante gives way to despair and doubt because in the, there's no more light. And light has the connotations in Christian writing always of the presence of God. Right? It's not just, it's day and night. When in John's gospel, when uh, Jesus gives the morsel to Judas to betray him, says, go and do it quickly. Judas goes out and John, in John's gospel, it says, and it was night. I think, why do you add that detail? Is there any significance to that? I mean, that night happens every, at the end of every day, but he tells us it was night, right at the moment of betrayal. Why? Because the light of the world is just given over himself to the powers of darkness. Right at that point, it's a theological point. John, John, the theologian, is speaking of Jesus as the light of the world, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it, he says right at the beginning. But here he gives over himself to betrayal, and, we, and John says, and it was night. Right? And it's anticipating the uh, time when, right at noon, when the earth is dark for three hours at the crucifixion. Right? For three hours. That's a theological point. It, it's also a literal point. The sun was blotted out for three hours. Is that an eclipse? There is no eclipse that goes on for three hours. It's a symbol of uh, darkness. It's a symbol of God's wrath as well. People are terrified. It's judgment. It's a sign of judgment against whom? Against Christ. By whom? By God. Why is God angry at Jesus? Because Jesus bears God's wrath. But Jesus is not a sinner, so it's our sin on his shoulders, etc. So these are all theological points, but they're also points about darkness, right? This is, this is a darkness. What does it signify? Well, it has an allegorical significance. It's a literal event, yes, but it has that multiple. You have to understand it on those levels. It's a literary way of, of writing and thinking, but you must, you must actually, you, don't, you can't understand scripture if you can't think this way. And you get these uh, ways of reading by reading good literature, I submit to you. So he goes on there, and uh, at this point, uh, there are references to Moses and Aeneas, um, who ignores omens. There's also Paul and Acts, who resists the ordained work that must be done, and there is a sort of dream vision here. And it... Uh, Dante denies that he's like Aeneas or Paul in line uh, 32. You know, I'm not worthy to be either of these figures. He says, why should I go there, down to the underworld? Who sanctions it? For I am not Aeneas, am not Paul. Paul had a, th a vision that took him up to the third heaven, right? And he, so, I'm not that type of, like Aeneas goes down to the underworld, he's, he's driven down by the fates and he rises up. I'm, I, I can't go to the underworld. I'm not worthy to this. Nor I, nor others think myself so worthy. Why I then? Therefore, if I consent to start this journey, I fear my venture may be wild and empty. You're wise, Virgil, you know far more than what I say. Epic simile. And just as he who unwills what he wills, and shifts what he intends to seek new ends so that he's drawn from what he had begun, so was I in the midst of that dark land because with all my thinking, I annulled the task I had so quickly undertaken. So he agrees to go on the voyage and then he prevaric or he immediately starts stuttering and I don't want to go, I'm not worthy to go. Well, what did Moses say when he was called by God to follow him? I, I can't do this. But he's been called to do it. But he's, there's a, a sort of rebellion. He's going to have to be tried. This is a symptom of his sin. Virgil replies, If I've understood what you've said, replied the shade of that great-hearted one, your soul has been assailed by cowardice. Coward. Which often weighs so heavily on a man, distracting him from honorable trials as phantoms frighten beasts when shadows fall. 
that you may be delivered from this fear. I'll tell you why I came and what I heard when I first felt compassion for your pain. I was among those souls who are suspended. He's in limbo. We'll come to that in Canto 3. A lady called to me, so blessed, so lovely, that I implored to serve at her command. Her eyes surpassed the splendor of the stars. And she began to speak to me so gently and softly with angelic voice. She said, O oh, spirit of the courteous Mantuan, whose fame is still a presence in the world and shall endure as long as the world lasts, my friend Dante is down there and you got to go fetch him. Okay. Why Virgil? I forgot to this, and I said that I would look at this. Why Virgil? Why is he seen as the guide here? And I, I mentioned that in Virgil's fourth eclogue, he writes seemingly prophesying the, a coming age when a child would lead. It, it's, it's, uh, compare and contrast it with uh, Isaiah chapter 9. I'll just read a little section of it. Sing we woods, woods worthy of a consul, let them be. Now the last age by Cume Sibyl sung has come and gone in the majestic role of circling centuries begins anew. Justice returns. Remember the golden age? Justice returns, returns old Saturn's reign with a new breed of men sent down from heaven. Only do thou at the boy's birth in whom the iron shall cease, the golden race arise, befriend him, chaste Lucina, tis thine own Apollo reigns. And in thy consulate this glorious age, O Pollio, shall begin, and the months enter on their mighty march. Under thy guidance, whatso tracks remain of our old wickedness, once done away, shall free the earth from never ceasing fear. So all of the signs of the fall, and chiefly the fear. He shall receive the life of gods, and himself be seen of them, and with his father's worth reign o'er a world at peace. For thee, O oh boy, first shall the earth untilled pour freely forth her childish gift. So no longer will he have to till the fields. They will just give of themselves the fruits, the gadding ivory stay, etc. And he says, of themselves untended will the she-goats then bring home their udders swollen with milk. They'll milk themselves, basically. <laughs> right? You won't have to work anymore. This is pagan epic, but still pagan vision. But. And he says, um, the serpent too shall die. Die shall the treacherous poison plant, and afar and wide Assyrian spices bring. But soon as thou sk hast skill to read of hero's fame and of thy father's deeds, and inly learn what virtue is, so you know it in your heart, and not just on uh, something that you read, it'll be in your heart, you will, these sorts of things, and what will happen? Um, the, of the monstrous lion, the flocks will have no fear. The very cradle shall pour forth for thee caressing flowers and the serpent will die and so forth. These are seen by the church as messianic prophecies by a man who did not know Christ. And, but he, and when we come to the end of the purgatorio, he's described as a man by another, who, who by the way, Virgil led a man, another man to faith uh, who read his poetry. And he describes Virgil as a man who did not see the light but had a lamp behind his back and let others see the light. Through, through this. He read this and saw that's a reference to Christ. That's God speaking through a man that did not know the truth and yet led others to the truth. How is this possible? But that's why Virgil has this place here. It was, God was speaking to him unknowingly. Anyway, uh, I'll pick it up next time and we will come to gate, uh, Canto 3, the gates of hell, and I will make progress from there.